Well, yes, I was about to say that uh, this uh, lecture is not an easy one, and I still uh, say that it will not be easy for uh, one main reason. Um, of course, it's not very easy uh, for me to, to speak of a book which is not mine, but which is also mine, uh, the book uh, by Rancière called the, uh, in the, the American version it will, call, it will be called uh, The Groove of the Poem, uh, reading Philip Beck. And it, it is about to come out in the um, Minnesota University Press in a translation by Drew Burke. And I just received the, 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 the translation. And uh, my uh, goal is not to, uh, to speak uh, uh, of this book in, in itself, but to uh, uh, put this book in connection with a a very um, critical uh, issue um, about uh, speculative poetry. But the issue of speculative poetry is not interesting in itself. Why? So the question would be uh, the following one. Why are we uh, again attending a war on speculative poetry? within the current disseminated world war, and why does it matter now? In our general uh, predicament, if our general predicament is to be qualified as a sentimental one, according to Schiller's definition, I am about to, to speak uh, about this definition this predicament of ours may simply explain all the pains and sufferings of mankind and consequently the need to declare war, everyone's need to declare war in a way, in order to cure the sufferings themselves and thus to generate new pains which are supposed to lead us to a spiritual healing. That's a strange beginning, isn't it? I mean that uh, the issue of speculative uh, poetry is to be connected uh, to uh, our general predicament. And we, are, we all are uh, sentimental human beings according to Schiller's definition. So what is uh, uh, Schiller's definition. I would like to give you a quotation by Schiller now. Schiller uh, wrote in uh, his book uh, Naive Poetry and Sentimental Poetry in the end of uh, the 18th century. The poets are everywhere according to their concept the guardian of nature. The poets are everywhere according to their concept, the guardian of nature. Nature is uh, a word to mean the world. Where they can no longer entirely be the latter, the guardian of nature or of the world. And already experience in themselves the destructive influence of capricious and artificial forms, or indeed have had to struggle with the same, then will they appear as the witnesses and the avengers of nature. They will either be, either be nature or they will seek the lost nature. Therefrom arise two entirely different kinds of poetry through which the entire province of poetry is exhausted and measured out. <clears throat> 
all poets who are really such will, according to the time in which they flourish, or as accidental circumstances have influenced upon their general education and upon their passing dispositions of mind, belong either to the naive or to the sentimental. So, uh, what Schiller means is that we all are sentimental human beings, and this uh, uh, word, sentimental, means that we all are experiencing in ourselves and uh, outside, in the uh, outward world, the destructive forces we are uh, fighting against. So it's a strange way to be sentimental uh, if we uh, have, uh, uh, if we bear in mind the uh, current uh, meaning of the, of the, the term, but since uh, sentimental means uh, that we, our feelings are uh, destructive and are likely to be uh, destructed at the same time, the word sentimental uh, is still relevant and ha has to be kept and uh, thought through. So, of course, uh, in this book, Rancière uh, speaks all the time uh, about this uh, uh, predicament of ours, uh, this sentimental predicament and of uh, the strength that is likely to be uh, acknowledged uh, to poetry, the strength to fight against our uh, destructive uh, predicament. That's the only stake of uh, this book, right? It's a complex book uh, in which Rancière is interested in my attempt, but in which also he asked me to have discussion with him and to, uh, to try to uh, say whether poetry uh, may uh, still uh, help us feel our predicament and think through this predicament. No, I will not tell you uh, if there is a conclusion in it, but um, it, it was not easy for me to speak of this book because, um, because this book is in itself a symptom of something, of our predicament too. So. What's, interested, what's interesting in, in this book is that Hegel and Schiller uh, play uh, special parts in it. Those names are uh, like uh, the names of two uh, uh, strange characters. They come and go. Hegel, Schiller, Hegel, Schiller, Schiller, Hegel. No. There is a sort of quarrel between Schiller and Hegel. So I would like to, to try to understand why there is such a, a struggle behind uh, the, the struggle between a philosopher who doesn't want to be only a philosopher, who claims he is a reader, Rancière, and someone who, uh, um, in a way, only wants to be a poet, and who is he's not uh, only one to Rancière's mind. He constantly says that I'm not only a poet, but also a philosopher. I don't agree with that, in a way. But, so, 
There is a quarrel behind the, the quarrel. Of course, there are always walls behind walls. But. So why, why Schiller and Hegel? We usually uh, think that because Hegel uh, much admires Schiller's work, there is a, a, a sort of uh, natural or historical kinship, uh, kinship between them. And Hegel, he, of course, uh, read and uh, used a lot of uh, Schiller's work in his uh, lessons about uh, aesthetics and especially when he speaks in the end of, uh, about poetry. But what I uh, realized uh, reading this, uh, this book again a few uh, uh, weeks ago and a few days ago I reread this, this book, I do not quite understand. I try to understand this book. What I realized is that, in a way, uh, th there is a, a quarrel between Schiller and Hegel. And I would like to, to say a few words about this discrepancy between two gestures. Schiller's gesture, uh, I just uh, began to uh, explain it. Schiller says that in our sentimental predicament, we uh, are not uh, naive anymore, okay? But we want, we still want to be naive, right? We cannot go back to uh, the, the heroic uh, uh, ancient age, but we uh, feel a tremendous need that cannot be reduced to uh, fill the gap between us and the uh, lost world. But what is lost? That's, that's the, uh, exactly the issue. What are we uh, feeling? Uh, what is our feeling to be disconnected? Uh, what, do, do, what does this feeling mean to, uh, to feel to uh, this disconnection with the world uh, we are living in. I mean, feeling that we uh, do not manage to uh, have access to the world we are living in, actually, we realize that we do not have access to the idea of this world. We do not manage to have uh, access to the inner truth of this world. So, when Schiller says that our sentimental predicament implies that we, at the same time, feel that the world is lost, in a way, nature is lost, we, at the same time, want to think this loss. And to think this loss is to be connected to the idea of what we have lo uh, lost. You understand? Uh, that's a complex predicament, because, because uh, being uh, disconnected to the world we have to think, not only this, this, this disconnection itself, but we have to think the world, all the more. And that's precisely where poetry is at stake. Because poetry, to Schiller's mind, is precisely the gesture by which we can think our predicament. Think. So, that is why didactic poetry to Schiller's mind is so important. But didactic poetry to Hegel's mind is precisely the evidence of 
what we uh, uh, call uh, the end of art. Precisely. But to Schiller's mind, I quote, In general, only in, is in this sense, which means only because poetry can provide us with spiritual intuition, spiritual intuition. In general, only in this sense can didactic poetry be conceived without internal contradiction, without internal contradiction. For, to repeat it once more, poetry only possesses these two domains. Either it must stay in the world of sense, or it must stay in the world of ideas. <coughs> Since it can absolutely not thrive in the realm of concepts, or in the world of understanding. Yet, I confess, I know no poem of this kind, neither from ancient nor modern literature, which would have brought the concept which it treats either purely and completely down to the individual or up to the idea. The ordinary case, which is still goes, which still goes happily, no, sorry, when, when it still goes happily, is that the two are alternated. Concept and imagery, let's say. Such that the abstract concept dominates and that the imaginative power, which ought to govern in the poetical domain, is merely permitted to serve the understanding. And here comes the critical sentence. The didactic poem, wherein the thought itself were poetic, and it would also remain so, is still awaited. The didactic poem, wherein the thought itself were poetic, and it would also remain so, is still awaited. What does it mean? It's very simple. It means that uh, uh, not only that history in general is not over, but the history of forms is not over. And I, that is very important. Why is it so important to uh, bear in mind that the history of forms, and especially of literary forms, is not over? Because it's important because when you uh, speak of Schiller's uh, philosophy, as Rancière does, when you say that Schiller described our predicament, you cannot forget that uh, very uh, critical aspect. The history of forms is not over. We are still waiting for a didactic uh, poem who would still remain a poem, right? Because if, he's not, if it's not a poem, it's, it's something else. It's a, a, a disconnected form in which the sensuous and the super sensuous are really disconnected. But we are waiting for a sin uh, form, because we need it, because our soul and chest needs it, right? We need to be uh, one in a, in a very uh, simple uh, way. We are not one. Hmm? We are sensitive and thinking, and there is a constant tension between uh, the two elements of our being, uh, and that's the sentimental uh, uh, predicament, condition. <clears throat>
So poetry is likely to provide us with uh, this uh, synthesis uh, Schiller speaks of. Schiller says so, but Hegel doesn't say so. If we read closely, and I cannot do that uh, tonight, his uh, uh, the, the hundred pages about poetry in, in the end of his lessons about aesthetics, we uh, we can see uh, a very ambivalent uh, description of the, the history of poetry and of the history of forms. Why uh, is it an ambivalent description? Uh, why Hegel is uh, so... Uh, embarrassed, perplexed by this, uh, the issue of the history of forms. That's the, the point. And I would like to quote a few passages, oh, only a few because it would, it would uh, be too long. But tonight I just want to delineate the, the issue. So you already uh, understand why uh, uh, there is a quarrel between Hegel and Schiller, actually. Hmm? Because there is a history of forms uh, which implies or uh, which uh, involves the didactic poem itself in Schiller. Whereas in Hegel, the didactic poem stands for a uh, form that reveals the fact that poetry is already a point of passage to something else. And uh, I would like to quote Hegel here. I would have liked or dreamt to, to quote many pas passages, and I will not, because we haven't got time for that, but he says, Poetry destroys the fusion of spiritual inwardness with external existence to an extent that begins to be incompatible with the original conception of art, with the result that poetry runs the risk of losing itself in a transition from the region of sense into that of the spirit. And he speaks of poetry being as being a point of passage to religion and science. The higher spheres of religion and philosophy where there is a transition to that apprehension of the absolute which is still further removed from the sensuous sphere. What's very interesting in uh, the sentimental poetry, which means the modern poetry, is that spirit itself is on its own uh, ground. Hegel says so. Thanks to poetry, the spirit itself comes back to... Uh, onto his own ground. And why so? Because, says Hegel, because what a poem shapes is what he calls spiritual forms. The material which is assigned to poetry, the material, I mean, is are the spiritual forms. It is spiritual forms which take the place of possibility and provide the material to be given shape, just as marble, bronze, color, and musical notes were the material earlier on. Thus, 
the spirit becomes objective to itself on its own ground, thanks to poetry. But Hegel would agree, we completely agree and uh, uh, basically agree with Schiller if he said that poetry is uh, the location where the um, reconciliation uh, should or could take place. But as, we, as I said, uh, the modern poetry, as reflective poetry, is precisely at the same time uh, a f uh, an, an art which is a symptom of a passage to something else. Schiller wouldn't say that. Not at all. So the point is What's happening when you describe a history of forms, which is exactly what Hegel said. He describes, and in a magnificent way, the history of forms. What does uh, happen when he comes to a, a special uh, form, which in a way destroys the form itself. Didactic poetry. A didactic poem is a form which, in a way, tends to destroy itself and to be a sort of uh, pure content. Of course, if a didactic poem is a pure content, or the expression of a pure content, uh, it, it, it's not uh, uh, a poem anymore. That's why Schiller says we are still waiting for a, a didactic poem who, which would still remain a poem, right? What's happening there and what's happening now when a philosopher says uh, what's left to poetry in our sentimental predicament? What's left? Is that still useful to write a poem now? It's, the question is very simple. Is this just a, a game, a, a childish game? Or is it uh, something that matters? that matters in our uh, very difficult predicament. To my mind, it's very important to uh, stick to Schiller's uh, perspective and to understand what, re what remains open in Hegel's description, in spite of its ambivalence, it's very important to stick to uh, Schiller's perspective. The history of forms is not over. Hegel doesn't know what to say exactly about that because he he can uh, he, he, he witnesses in a way a process which implies a sort of uh, uh, end of the poetical of the history of poetical forms. Right? You understand what I mean? I speak about that because Rancière says that the history of forms, in a way, is over. So, to my mind, Rancière sticks to the, the Hegel's perspective If we uh, insist 
on what's not open in Hegel's perspective. The ambivalence is the hesitation between uh, uh, an open perspective, perspective, perspective and a closed one. That's ambivalence. Hegel, to my mind, and I read through these uh, lessons on and on, hesitate actually uh, and doesn't say that uh, of course the history in general is not over but that special part of the history of forms may be said to be over if we read the, uh, the lessons about aesthetics but the contrary may also be said about it, because he hesitates. That's ambivalence. You understand? In Schiller's text there is no uh, ambivalence at all. We are still waiting for a didactic poem. So when Hegel uh, describes, and I, I cannot uh, quote all the passages where he uh, insists on the kinship between speculative poetry and uh, uh, on speculative uh, prose and poetry. You all know those texts? Or you don't? You don't know? I will quote them uh, in, a, in a moment, uh, or some of them. When he insists on that, It means that, uh, in a way, he, uh, he knows that poetry still keeps a strength. But, at the same time, he defines poetry as a point of passage to speculative uh, prose. So that, that's the ambivalence uh, I speak of. And when Rancière, uh, in the end of, the, of this book, says and we quote it In my opinion, the best phrase for thinking what's left to poetry what a post-poetry is The best phrase for thinking it remains the one Schiller invented and which you yourself echo. You, it's me. Sentimental poetry. Between the lost dream of a world that would spontaneously be translated into poetic formulas and the impossible dream of a finally discovered harmony of language with thought. A poetry after a poetry after, what, what he calls a poetry after, could be defined as a poetry which knows that Hegel took place and nevertheless acts as if one should as much as possible delay the hour of his arrival. I repeat this sentence. A poetry after could be defined as a poetry which knows that Hegel took place and nevertheless acts as if one should as much as possible delay the hour of his arrival. So, how is it possible for a poem to delay Hegel's arrival? That's the point. I do not know uh, now uh, for the time being, I do not know, uh, after rereading this book of his, if Rancière really uh, think that uh, a poem can delay Hegel's arrival. Hegel's arrival means it's, it is the end of the history of forms. But to my mind, in Hegel's texts, 
there is this uh, ambivalence, this hesitation, this cautiousness, we, we could say, or the op openness, that's the word, which uh, uh, um, forbid a philosopher to conclude to uh, the end of the history of forms. But he he's prompted, Hegel is prompted to uh, nevertheless to conclude to uh, this process uh, of uh, to this passage to some something else. He is prompted to think that poetry is a point of passage to something else. So when Rancière speaks of a poetry after, after the classical uh, age, or after the, uh, what he calls in uh, the phenomenology the, uh, the aesthetic religion, when, he's, when Rancière uh, speaks of, about a poetry after, he's prompted to define it by ambivalence. He's prompted to define poetry by its ambivalence, its supposed ambivalence. A poetry after being a poetry which is at the same time capable of building a new form and not capable of building a new form. You understand what I mean? What, what's uh, the issue to me, to be, uh, which I try to sum up now, is that Hegel's ambivalence is transferred by Rancière to the essence of poetry itself. You understand? And in a way, Schiller is a, used in a way he shouldn't be used. There's no ambivalence in, in Schiller's text, actually. The history of forms is still uh, possible. But if you define a poetry after and for instance, a didactic poem which would still remain a poem. As a poem uh, at the same time uh, defined by its strength and its weakness, its ability to build a new form and its uh, being not capable of building a new form, you define poetry by ambivalence. And this ambivalence, I'm uh, forced to, to say, this ambivalence is also destructive. So I refuse to define uh, poetry as a destruct destructive form, uh, as such, as an ambivalent uh, um, connection to the world and to the history in general. Because uh, as long as uh, poetry is defined by its uh, ambivalent predicament, poetry has no strength at all. So that's, to me, that's what's uh, one, of, one of the, the aspects of this book, which is just a, a lively thing that just uh, came to me. And, uh, uh, and I... I uh, it's, it's a live uh, performance now because I try to, uh, to tell you uh, how I can uh, deal with this book, which is, of course, uh, uh, also a dialogue with uh, a very uh, subtle philosopher who at the same time says, I'm not only a philosopher, but I'm, I'm also a prose writer. And he constantly says, of course, uh, that uh, prose is also uh, poetic. And I constantly say that if prose is, and especially the philosophical prose, if the uh, thinking prose is also a, a poem, uh, 
or likely to be said uh, to be a poem, it's because each and every prose is uh, based on an idea of poetry. And Hegel constantly says so too. He says, for instance, poetry is older than skillfully elaborated prosaic speech. So, even in Hegel, poetry is the transcendental of uh, every prose, each and every prose. I could quote much, uh, much more, but I will not. So, did you uh, quite understand my uh, uh, attempt tonight, my difficult attempt? I wonder why a philosopher uh, is interested in poems nowadays. I wonder. Do you understand what I mean? Why? If poetry is not useful, is no longer useful, then philosophers should not be interested in poetry. They should not be interested in current or modern poems. They shouldn't. So it means that to their minds, to their mind, poetry still uh, has a strength. Uh, let's say, a non-ambivalent strength. So, there is a war, a very ancient war between poetry and philosophy, a current one, because what's at stake is precisely uh, a war about ambivalence itself. And philosophy can uh, claim or pretend to uh, destroy this ambivalence. But if you define poetry by this, <coughs> this ambivalence, then you uh, wish to destroy poetry. So if you speak with, uh, if you want to read poems, and if you want to speak with someone who writes poems. You may wish to speak with the poems in order to uh, define them as a point of passage to something else, which means to reduce them in a way. You admire their uh, uh, um, experiments, uh, virtuosity, and so on. You admire things, but in a way, you still uh, uh, maintain that, in a way, poetry is over, right? So I'm very happy to, to uh, see that uh, my attempts uh, have induced and prompted a prose writer, a philosopher, to be interested in them. And that, it's, to me, it's very strange, but it doesn't uh, prevent me from being aware of the situation. We've got a situation here, as, as you say, in, in America. We've got a situation here. <coughs> That's over for tonight.